Can you cast your mind back to when the Opal Corsa name was like the vibe, right? All the cool peeps had an Opal Corsa. But nowadays, it just doesn't really tug on those like petrol heartstrings like it used to. And that's not even the fault of, say, Opal or even Stellantis. Because if you think about it, when the Corsa was owned by General Motors and was so popular, the world was a completely different place and everybody loved a hatchback. But now the world is all about the SUV and the humble hatchy, well, has been left out in the cold. Well, unless you're the Polo Vivo, which means that like the sun is very much still shining on your bonnet. <laughs> The Opel Corsa just now lives in a very different world, like I said, and it is a tough one. But Opel is not going to be deterred by that. In fact, I am sitting in the facelifted version of it. So does it have what it takes to still be in the game? Well, let's see. When you step inside this GS Line range topper, it is all black inside, barring this stitching on the seats, which I really love and I've only really just noticed, but it does give it a very cool flair, I have to say. You've got a new 10 inch IntelliLink infotainment system here, and you've also got a seven inch instrument cluster, also digital. On the entry level models, that's 3.5, but this is obviously the top of the range. Now, I'm going to mention this infotainment system mainly because I don't mind that it's even a little bit outdated and very, very simple. My issue with it is that plugging in your phone for Android Auto, which I've done, it drops constantly. Now, I've only ever experienced that with wireless Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. This, I feel, shouldn't be happening when it is plugged in, and that has driven me mad. So I've taken it off, and I just only use the Bluetooth, which is unfortunate because you've got Android Auto, you'd want to be able to use it. The steering wheel has been redesigned. It's got a beautiful feel on it, steering wheel, but I love it. It is comfortable, and some people really might appreciate the sort of simplicity of it, but I can't help but feel that it almost needs a bit of an upgrade, which is a weird thing to say when I'm sitting in an upgraded version of this car. <laughs> Seating is pretty comfortable. The legroom is okay. Um, there is this thing that sits in between your legs if you are sitting in the middle, but it is removable, so that's good. The downfall maybe is the boot. It's at 309 liters, and the star student, the Polo, is at 351 liters. And again, if you're in the segment, you need to be a segment leader for some things if you're gonna try and be a really top seller. So what's new on this updated Corsa? Well, as with its Mokka, Crossland and Grandland siblings, the Corsa 2 adopts the brand's visor front fascia design, which is flanked by a pair of LED headlights. This boasts a chrome-styled grille and belt line, B pillars and roof spoiler with a gloss black finish and a black two-tone roof. It also sports a shark fin antenna and bicolored diamond cut 16-inch alloy wheels. There are three derivatives available, which includes the entry-level light model, the Corsa Edition, and this model that I'm driving, which is the top of the range GS line. Okay, guys, I'm in the facelifted Opel Corsa, and I actually quite enjoy driving, especially when I'm up to speed and I'm just like driving. And it, also it's fine around town, etc. The same engines remain, which is a little bit of let down if you consider that the other markets get a diesel model and a mild hybrid petrol model. We remain with the 1.2 litre in two states of tune. So this gets 96 kilowatts of power and 230 newton meters of torque, whereas the other models, they get 74 kilowatts of power and 205 newton meters of torque. It is not a sporty Corsa, which is maybe what your mind is gonna to go to. Probably not the most dynamic or engaging drive, but it's certainly just easy and almost fuss free. Okay, so this car overall for me is actually great. Like it's fine and it's lovely to drive. It's quite comfortable. I think it looks okay. Um, it feels nice. Like I said, I love the steering wheel, whatever. It feels like it's well built. Bit of road noise, bit of tire noise, kind of lot actually. Here's the issue for me. So pricing, so it starts at around 375, goes up to 460,000 for this model. It's a lot of money when you consider that it's not exactly a lot of car. But my point is, 
if you need to compete against the polo, well, you need to at least undercut it in price and hopefully everything else. I don't like saying it because, like I say, I like it. Like I'm happy driving it right now, I'm comfortable, you know, it's just in a very tough world, in a tough segment at the moment. Before the break, Juliet gave us her impressions of the updated Opel Corsa. Now it's time to find out if my two guests concur. Let's start with you, Francois. The Opel Corsa was a staple of the South African small car diet many years ago. We all remember the ad campaigns and we've all spent some time in one. Is it the same car now and can it go back to the heyday of old? I think Opel had um, historically had such a big... Um, presence sort of at the top of, of car buyers' minds. And I think a lot of it was down to their success in motorsport. You yeah, know? and racing, yeah. Yeah, so, and especially um, like in the um, sort of mid 80s, early 90s in the Group N, when there was a very close correlation between the cars that were racing and the cars that you could actually buy. And they show. Sunday, sell on Monday. Exactly. So, I mean, but to be fair, you know, that doesn't really exist for any manufacturer anymore. So no one can really cash in on that. So it's interesting. Um, I don't quite know where Opel lost that appeal, that they, like that sort of mass appeal that they just had to so many people. Um, because I don't think it's down to the product. You know, it's still like the cars are still good. I'm going to have to agree with you. When we drove it on launch, um, I really got the sense that it was a good car, and this is, has obviously been in the country since I think 2021. Mm -hmm. um, they've done a minor update, and it no nothing's really changed. Um, but it, it just is a little bit sad that it doesn't seem to get a lot of attention, as you mentioned slightly earlier on in the show with the Triton, because the, the product is substantial. Mm. It shares a lot with its Peugeot counterpart, and Peugeot has that sort of premium feel on the inside. Even the, the buttons and the switch gear just feel the brushed aluminium feels expensive. Surely that has to count for something. And then controversial topic, Stellantis in the news recently about looking at some of its brands. Alex, do you think Opel or Vauxhall could be on the chopping block as well in the future? Oh, you know, it's obviously rumor mm. um, at this point whether they are going to be putting some of their brands through the chopping block. They've got a lot. When it comes to Opel, though, I don't, I'm not sure. We're obviously a small market in the grand scheme of things and this must be said now opal's corsa has won the it, i think it's the best selling car in germany and it's the it's one of the best selling cars in the uk as well and i think also you know further to your point um you know we have to address the elephant in the room which is that south africans nowadays in general are leaning towards suvs crossovers mm. and which yeah. is is perhaps the biggest shortcoming of this car not as a b segment hatch but as a car in that price range, mm. the interior packaging is um, compact. Um, <laughs> if I'm being, you are the tallest person on the. <laughs> yeah. To be fair. Yeah. So it's I can find a comfortable driving position. That's not a problem. But then no one can sit behind me. The boot is, I think, adequate. Um, not tiny, but it comes down to a needs analysis, right? So if you have a small family um, and you do need to um, cart, uh, you know, kids and um, you know, like school gear or whatever, like prams and stuff around, then this is not even worth considering because it's going to be too small. But this is infinitely more enjoyable to drive than just about, I'm not talking about performance SUVs, but you know, anything, you know, this side of a million. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, there's just something so immediate and connected, you know, about driving a car that's smaller, lower to the ground. Yeah. Um, that appeals to a smaller part of the market as time yes. goes on. Eh? One more thing before we move on. How do you think Opel's tumultuous past in South Africa, having left and then come back almost immediately, how do you think that affected this car specifically, Alex? So, so yeah, that obviously didn't do them any favors. South Africans, remember... Yeah. I mean, we've got Proton, we've got uh, many other Chinese automakers that have come before, and very few of them have found the same successes that they might have had before. It's almost, mm. uh, it's been the Achilles heel. But we, on the launch, we attended the Stellantis um, uh, 
stock facility in Roslyn, I want to say. And um, they're obviously really committed to making sure that, uh, you know, th they've got their investments in the country, they've got their dealership footprint, and they've got uh, very promising um, service offerings that um, make these kinds of cars appealing. Um, I know it's the same with Citroen, where if they can't repair your car while it's under warranty within, mm. I think it's a day, correct me if I'm wrong here, they will give you a, um, a higher, or not a higher car, but they will provide you with a, um, with a vehicle, vehicle. courtesy vehicle. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a little detail that uh, will give people peace of mind and just knowing that they've got such a, a massive set of infrastructure in the country um, can maybe quash that thought in people's minds if they are doubting it, yeah. in mind. That's mm -hmm. what I think.